Welcome to this online lesson looking at the impact of World War I medicine on both war and peace. This is the first of two parts on this topic. This is going to look at medicine in the early 1900s. Particularly we're going to be looking at antiseptic surgery, anaesthetics, blood transfusions and x-rays. The aims are to describe early 1900s advances in medicine, to explain the link between peacetime discoveries and wartime medicine, and to assess the link between civilian medicine and war itself. Before we get on to that though, let's do a do now task. Consider the medical developments that we've already looked at. That would mean in previous lessons or within your own studies. Describe fully how one of these developments, either antiseptic surgery, anaesthetics, blood transfusions or x-rays, how might help a wounded soldier. There's a real clue in the x-rays one, for example. Secondly, explain why two of these examples might help a wounded soldier. And then thirdly, explain which development would most likely have the biggest impact on World War I. Okay, pause the video now and remember the difference between describing how this would help a wounded soldier and explaining how they might help a wounded soldier. Press play when you're ready to continue. All right, let's crack on then. How might one of these developments help a wounded soldier? Well, I'll start with one myself. Why not look at blood transfusions? The sorts of wounds that soldiers are often get, are getting often resulted in huge blood loss. Being able to top up someone's uh, blood supplies with blood from elsewhere would be a great way of keeping them alive. What about explaining why two of these examples might help a wounded soldier? Well, just to save a bit of time, I'll do one. Let's look at the x-rays. That's a genuine World War I x-ray showing a German bullet lodged inside someone's bone. Now, without having the x-ray, you might have to go really digging around in there and following the trajectory of the bullet in order to find it and digging it out. This would cause much worse wounds and also would increase the amount of time it took for that patient to recover, whilst also increasing the risk of infection. X-rays allow doctors to, and surgeons to very easily find where the shrapnels and bullets would be and therefore help the patients. So which development would most likely have the biggest impact on World War I medicine? Well, that's likely to be up to you. But an awful lot of them, including blood transfusions and x-rays, would result in improvements in surgery. So perhaps surgery overall is the one that improves most. We're going to have a look now at the progress between antiseptic surgery, as developed by Joseph Lister in the 19th century, and aseptic surgery, which was becoming more common by the time of the First World War. We've got two pictures here which show the difference. Firstly, an artist's impression of Lister's antiseptic surgery technique using the carbolic spray to spray it over the surgeon's hands to wash the equipment and also to spray it in the air over the wound to prevent infection. We've also got a, a picture, in this case a photograph, in source B, which is a photograph of an aseptic operating theatre in 1910. It's not quite as aseptic as there would be today, but you can see that everyone is wearing these steam-treated uh, clothing, which would be germ-free, or as far as possible, and some of the people in there are wearing things like face masks and hair coverings to prevent germs and infections spreading. The late 19th century, in the late 19th century, there were further advances in surgery. Robert Koch discovered steam sterilised surgical tools were better than using acid. Not only did it kill the, uh, the bacteria better, but also it was helpful to the tools and less painful for the patient. There was a move from trying to kill germs to making sure that there were none in the room in the first place. Now, this is the difference between antiseptic and aseptic. Antiseptic acts against germs. So there are germs in the operating theatre, but these are killed before they infected, infect the wounds. This progresses into aseptic surgery, which we would see today. Equipment and clothing are sterilised with steam. There should not be any germs present in the operating theatre as far as possible. Your task then. Describe the difference between antiseptic and aseptic surgery, and as an extension, explain why aseptic is better. Then, explain why Lister's carbolic spray was unpopular. If you're not sure about this, I do have a lesson on 19th century surgery that you can check out. And thirdly, study sources A and B. Describe between two and three reasons why, uh, between the content of these sources. I'll, I'll explain that again, kind of mince my words a little bit. Describe two to three differences, sorry, between the content of these sources. And then secondly, explain why the clothes and equipment are different in these sources as well. Pause the video here while you answer those tasks and press play when you're ready to continue. Well, let's see what you've come up with then. 
Hopefully we've got the difference between antiseptic surgery, where with antiseptic surgery, the germs are there, but they're killed. And with aseptic surgery, the idea is to prevent the germs being there in the first place. Lister's carbolic spray was unpopular because of the effect that it had on both patients and the surgeon. It was found that the carbolic spray uh, harmed patients' recovery in terms of helping their wounds to heal because it would sting so much and because it would actually attack the flesh where it landed. Similarly, uh, surgeons would find that it really hurt and dried out their hands as well. For example, if they had any little cuts on their hands, the carbolic spray would really make these sting. Sources A and B. Have a look at them. Lots of differences between them. For example, you could comment upon the differences of the clothing of the surgical staff. Pretty much regular everyday clothes of the period are being worn in source A, whereas specialist surgical smocks are being worn in source B. Also, we cannot see any uh, evidence of the carbolic spray in source B because it's not being used by that point. You might notice as well that some of the staff in source B are women. This highlights the increasing importance of women in both hospitals and, of course, as you might have seen in previous lessons, in treating soldiers in the First World War. But this is actually a peacetime hospital, so it shows that this was pretty much regular standard practice by this point. Don't forget the, um, the uh, importance of Florence Nightingale in improving this. So why are the clothes and equipment different in these sources? Well, remember, in source A, this is antiseptic surgery. If there are germs all over the surgeon's hands and all over their clothes, that doesn't matter so much with this technique because they're going to be killed by the carbolic spray. In source B, on the other hand, that would be unacceptable. You can see that many of the staff are wearing gloves, They've got masks on, they've got uh, hairnets and, and uh, hats on, which are all helping to prevent the germs coming into contact with the patient at all, rather than just having to kill them. And kill the germs, I mean, rather than the patient. That would hardly be the idea, would it? All right, let's move on. Let's consider the role of aseptic surgery in war. Another comparison between two sources here. At the top, we can see source B again, which we've already mentioned. Then below that, we can see a full photograph of an operating theatre in a temporary hut at a casualty clearing station in around 1916. There are similarities and differences again. Above all else, aseptic surgery requires a perfectly clean surgical environment. Here are your tasks. 4A. What about the battlefields of the Western Front would make keeping things clean so difficult? As a challenge, refer to a specific real battle in your explanation and the circumstances surrounding it. Secondly, what about World War I wounds made it so difficult to avoid infection despite aseptic surgery? And then as a challenge, you can be more specific. Refer to a specific weapon or type of wound in your answer. Pause the video now while you attempt those questions. Off you go. So for 4A, remember that many of the Western Front battlefields were absolutely caked in mud. There was also dust flying around and it would be very difficult to keep things clean because of all the movement of people. Being more specific though, consider the impact of the Battle of Arras. At Arras, many of the hospitals were dug into, into caves underground. These were often damp, dark and not particularly sanitary. What about World War I wounds? Well, often the mud of the battlefield could be carried inside wounds because parts of uniforms or just the mud itself would get into the wound in the process of the soldier being wounded or even as they're being carried by the stretcher bearers across no man's land and through the trenches afterwards. A specific type of wound which was particularly susceptible to this was shrapnel wounds where the blunt pieces of, uh, of shrapnel might take large chunks of clothing into the wound and really spread the mud around. It would also take this, this sort of muck deep into the wounds as well which would be very difficult to treat. Remember no antibiotic medicines in World War I so once an infection took hold it could well be game over for that person. Now let's have a look at another comparison between sources B and C this time. Task 5A. Describe two to three differences between the sources. I've circled some hints now to help you out. Explain two to three examples of how the surgery in source C may be less safe than the surgery in source B. And then explain why these two, uh, by, why two of the differences in source C are actually compromises. In other words, it's where they're making the best of a bad situation. Why it might not be possible to make the surgery any better than it is in source C. Take a few minutes to complete those questions and press play when you're ready to continue. So let's have a look at some of the differences. Well, first of all, we might notice that there are a similar number of people in there, but not all of them are wearing these surgical smocks. 
Although I point out that actually there's a similar mix between men and women between the two sources. Another difference is the room itself. One is a very sterile, easy to clean, tiled environment which would be easy to steam clean or wipe down. In source C though, this is a temporary hut. It looks like it's made out of wood with open windows, etc. around. And then what about a third example? Well, it looks a lot more cramped in source C as well. These people are crowded around that particular um, operating patient, and that possibly would be worse for infection control too. So, two to three examples of how the surgery in source C may be less safe than source B. I've already mentioned the overcrowding. This would make it more likely that infections could spread from the people into the patient. We've already mentioned the clothing. It means that not everyone in this room is wearing the sterile equipment. Notice too that none of the staff in source C are wearing face masks to help prevent infections, although some of them are at least wearing these uh, headdresses. So what might differences might be compromises here? Well, for one thing, the crowded space is likely to be because of simply a lack of space and having to do an awful lot of these uh, operations within temporary buildings, buildings that might not even be specially adapted or even purpose-built for this particular purpose as an operating theatre. Also think about how quickly they would possibly have to work. They would have to get through an awful lot of patients in a major offensive, and so therefore they would cram people in as quickly as they could. Any other examples? Well, it might be the elements of the fact that some of these people are military personnel rather than simply medical personnel, accounting for some of the military uniforms there. Ultimately, though, they're making the best with a bad situation. It's not a bad compromise there. The tools would still be clean, there would still be lots of infection control. So, for example, you can still see the use of these surgical smocks for the people nearest to the patient and also the use of gloves, gloves etc. So it's not that the surgery in source C under the circumstances is particularly bad. It's just not under ideal circumstances, given the technology and the knowledge that existed at the time. A. Oh, a B. Blood groups and blood transfusion. A, O, A, B might sound a bit like A, O, a B, but actually these are the main blood groups. Maybe this silly phrase will help you to remember it. Blood transfusion had been attempted in the past and worked between humans. Well, it sometimes worked anyway. People had even tried transfusions with animals, but these had always failed. Check out this illustration from the late 17th century. Doctors did not know why blood transfusions sometimes worked between humans, sometimes didn't, but always failed between animals. Ultimately, they didn't realise that there was a difference between blood in people, blood in animals, and actually different blood between different people. The problems of blood transfusion are threefold. Firstly, rejection. For some reason, some blood transfusions worked, other patients suffered a terrible reaction. Storage. Blood couldn't be kept. In bottles, it would clot into an unusable goo. And also, the donor and patient need to be in the same room. To prevent clotting, both donor and patient needed to be side by side, and it needed to happen all at once. That's what we can see in this picture here, a photograph of an early blood transfusion between one person and another. So you can see that the person on the left with the rather grand looking moustache has got a needle in their arm with the blood coming out. And then we have the doctor or surgeon administering that transfusion to the patient who's lying down. So, quickly note down some of the problems, and as an extension, explain which problem do you think was most important to overcome if blood transfusions were ever going to work. Pause the video now. So hopefully we've noted down the problems of rejection, storage, and the fact that the donor and patient needed to be in the same uh, room at the same time. I think it's quite clear, though, that the most important of these problems to overcome, even though they are all important to an extent, is rejection. There's no point being able to store blood or solving the problem of the patients needing to be side by side if these transfusions are still going to be fail failing because you didn't understand the problem of rejection. We're now going to have a look through how each of these three problems was solved one at a time. We're going to start by transforming transfusion. You will shortly see information about blood transfusion and how the problems of re rejection, storage and having to have the patient and donor together were solved. You will need to include problem one, the solution to it, problem two, the solution to that, and problem three, the solution to that. You might want to produce a mind map like this, or if you prefer to lay out your notes in another way, do so now. But you need to make sure that you've got problem one, rejection and its solution, problem two, storage and its solution, and problem three, patient and donor together, and the solution to that. 
Pause the video here while you prepare your notes. So for each of these different sections, you're going to need to include at least between one and two facts for each section, ideally. Then fully explain how each problem was overcome. And lastly, explain A, which problem was the hardest to solve, and B, which was the most important to solve. You'll get reminders of these tasks as we go through, but you might want to pause the video here and make a brief note of them next to your notes. Right, let's move on to problem one, rejection. The human body contains about five litres of blood. Don't ask me how I know that. Lose too much and the body goes into shock and people die. This was a common side effect of complex surgery. Not to mention World War I wounds, but we'll come on to that in a moment. It was found that not all blood was compatible. This led to the rejection of donated blood. The solution was found in 1901. Austrian doctor Karl Landsteiner discovered the existence of three blood groups, A, B and O. The following year, a fourth group was discovered, AB. Following this, in 1907, Reuben Ottenberg, an American doctor, was the first person to match a donor and a recipient's blood type before a transfusion, therefore making it successful. He also identified that group O was universal and it could be used with any blood group. Okay, let's complete our first section on either our mind map or our structured notes. A reminder again, include at least one of the two facts with each section, more if you can manage it, fully explain how each problem was overcome, and then explain which problem was hardest to solve and which was most important to solve. Bear in mind with part three, you won't really be able to do that until you've seen all three problems solved. So pause the video here, make your notes and your explanations about problem one, rejection. The next problem, storage. We're going to look at this in two sub-parts, so you'll be able to add lots more to this one, hopefully. Blood coagulates, that means clots, as soon as it leaves the body. This is how scabs are formed, and it's actually a really useful part of blood's properties. This meant that the tubes used to collect or transfuse blood would become blocked. Scientists looked for a chemical which would stop this without actually damaging the blood and stopping it being useful. A chemical that might do this was sodium bicarbonate. In 1894, British scientist Almruf Wright concluded that the soluble solution of certain acids could also prevent clotting. However, he believed that there was no way to prevent the resulting convulsions that this caused within patients. There was also the danger of infection, but aseptic surgery methods helped with that. Okay, so let's start beginning to make our notes. What are the problems here and how are they beginning to solve them? You might, for example, want to mention the acids and sodium bicarbonate, but also the problems with these. So when it comes on to explaining which is the hardest problem to solve, that might be quite useful information. Pause the video while you complete the first section on storage. Let's continue our look at the problem of storage. In particular, we can look at a World War I example here, the Cambrai blood bank. In 1915, American doctor Richard Lewisham uh, discovered that adding sodium citrate to blood stopped blood clotting with few side effects. This allowed blood to be stored for longer. This is the real breakthrough here. Also in 1915, Richard Weil uh, discovered that such blood could be refrigerated and stored for 48 hours without it going off. In 1916, Francis Roos and James Turner found that by adding citrate glucose solution, blood could be stored for four weeks. So very quickly here, you can see that between 1915 and 1916, they've not only found a way of stopping the blood coagulating, but they've found ways of preserving it in a useful state for much longer. I wonder what brought about this change. Surely it couldn't be the pressures of World War I, could it? At the Battle of Cambrai in 1917, British-born American doctor Oswald Hope Robinson brought a bank of 22 units of universal blood in ice-refrigerated ammunition boxes. Some of the blood was 26 days old. That would have been a pretty incredible statistic for the time. Such an ice-refrigerated unit box can be seen in the photograph uh, in the middle of the screen. 
Oswald Hope Robinson treated 20 wounded Canadian soldiers with this blood. All were expected to die of shock from loss of blood. In fact, 11 of them survived. This showed that the stored blood in banks worked. This was important. Previously, blood was donated from less badly wounded men to more badly wounded men at a casualty clearing station. In major offensive, there were fewer likely wounded men to donate, causing shortages. These developments helped ensure that there was enough blood stored to prevent men dying from shock who otherwise could be saved. All right, let's complete our section on storage now. This is really where most of the solutions can be found, rather than ones that didn't really work. So concentrating on getting really detailed notes on this section. Pause the video while you complete your notes and do your explanations. Done? Okay, we'll move on to problem three. Patient and donor together. Use of blood transfusion in World War I was pioneered by Canadian doctor Lawrence Bruce Robinson at Boulogne Base Hospital. He used an indirect method where blood was syringed from the donor and then put into the patient. When the blood was accepted, it reduced the risk of death from shock, which was common even with some minor wounds. From 1917, transfusions became a standard treatment for shock at casualty clearing stations. Later, British doctor of the Royal Army Medical Corps, Lieutenant Geoffrey Keynes, developed a portable transfusion kit which regulated the flow of blood to prevent clotting. It couldn't use stored blood, however, as it could not be kept fresh. Keynes recounted this saving countless lives in casualty clearing stations. There's a picture of him there. Okay, let's complete your third section. Include at least one to two facts with it. Explain how it, this is, overcomes the problem. And now you should be able to make your mind up as to which problem was the hardest to solve and which was the most important to solve. Pause the video here while you complete your work, including this time part three. All right, let's move on. The bloody war. And no, I'm not swearing. Despite blood transfusions being a very important part of medicine, their use in World War I was more limited than you might think. Here's your task. Explain how blood transfusions could help wounded soldiers survive. You can refer to your mind map or other notes for this. Then, consider the limitations of blood transfusion in the early 1900s and the process of the, the evacuation route. Why might blood transfusion not have had such as big a role in the war as it otherwise might have done? Okay, pause the video here, and if you need to, refer to the diagram at the top which shows the evacuation route, in case you need to be reminded of that. Press play when you're ready to continue. It's really important to recognise that blood transfusions could help wounded soldiers survive. One of the most common ways that soldiers died was through shock from blood loss. By topping up the blood supplies within a soldier, they were more or less likely to go into shock and therefore more likely to survive. So what about the limitations of transfusion in the early 1900s? Why would this process of the evacuation route make it difficult? Well, consider the process. The stretcher bearers obviously wouldn't be able to transfuse blood, and if a patient was ble bleeding heavily, they would likely bleed out before they got to anywhere where they could be given a transfusion. The problems of storage and delicate nature of storing blood made it difficult to keep this in regimental aid posts, which were so often disrupted by enemy fire and so often filthy. Similarly, the motor ambulances were just about transporting so uh, soldiers from one place to another. But at the casualty clearing stations, the transfusions have got their first really good chance of being successful. And that's why the casualty clearing stations from 1917 used it as a standard treatment for shock. But look at that. They had to get through three stages of the evacuation route before they could even consider giving them blood transfusions. So many soldiers who needed them simply had died and bled out before that point. It might take several hours to get them to a CCS. And so that's why blood transfusion in the First World War maybe didn't uh, have quite such a big impact as you might expect. Let's look at our next big development, the X factor, or in this case, the X-ray factor. In 1895, Wilhelm Röntgen was re experimenting with rays in a test tube covered with black paper. To his surprise, the rays went straight through the paper. He later found that the rays went through flesh too, but not bone or metal. Here's what he said. All bodies are transparent to this agent. For brevity's sake, I shall use the expression rays, 
and to distinguish them from other, for others of this name, I shall call them X-rays. Soon, X-rays were being used to diagnose broken bones, as they still are today. Your task, then. Mobile X-ray machines were available on the Western Front of World War I. Why would X-ray machines be so vital in World War I? And as a challenge, relate the use of X-rays to a specific type of wound or situation. Pause the video now and answer that question. You might also want to make some notes on the development of X-rays as well. So hopefully you've made some notes on X-rays, but why would X-ray machines be so vital in World War I? Well, consider a situation where a piece of shrapnel has got lodged somewhere in a soldier. It might have ripped a jagged hole, and you can't find exactly where it's ended being lodged. So rather than having to go through in incredibly invasive surgery to dig it out, a simple x-ray could pinpoint precisely where that bullet or piece of shrapnel has ended up, just like in the x-ray photograph at the top of this screen. This is a photograph of a x-ray machine from the First World War, specifically a portable x-ray tent. It's a very nice, neat setup. All the equipment is handily carried in that truck there. And then you can fold out a tent behind. There's a table with the x-ray machine and photography set up behind that. And the whole thing is powered by the truck itself. Here's our provenance. Source A shows a mobile x-ray machine with the main equipment laid out for demonstration purposes in 1917. Clearly this isn't a battlefield, is it? The tent is where the patient could be laid out and have the x-ray machine, uh, the x-ray image taken. This could then be processed in the back of the lorry in a photographic darkroom. The equipment was powered by an onboard generator, usually just the truck's engine. Quality was lower than with static x-ray machines in hospitals, but it was adequate for finding things like bullets and shrapnel. Here are your tasks then. Describe the content of this source. What information does it provide about x-rays in World War I? And describe what you can see. Then explain how the provenance that means the purpose, the origin, and the date, might make it useful for an inquiry in the uses of, uh, use of x-rays in World War I. And then, to what, in what ways might the provenance limit its usefulness for an inquiry into x-rays in World War I? Are there any problems with it? Okay, pause the video here and complete those tasks. Hopefully you've been able to describe the source in some detail, including the truck, the use of the darkroom based aboard the lorry, uh, the tent where the person could have the x-ray taken, and so forth. So how does the pur purpose, um, origin, and date actually make this useful to us? Well, this is a real photograph from the First World War showing the real equipment that was used for this purpose. So this information is relevant to us. It also provides enough information for us to be able to tell how one of these mobile machines worked. The author is probably quite useful as well. As this has been produced as a demonstration, it's likely that it's been produced either by the Royal Army Medical Corps or by the manufacturers of this equipment. However, there are limitations to this as well. And again, it relates to that uh, idea that this is for demonstration purposes. Can this really, really uh, reflect the use of x-rays in action? This more shows an ideal circumstance of how it would be laid out so that it's easy to understand and so that it looks absolutely ideal. The trouble is, in wartime, things and circumstances are very rarely ideal. So it's likely that this is the ideal way that it would be used, but in wartime, in active service, it would not be used in quite such a neat way. But there are still some remaining problems. Despite its usefulness, X-ray technology was far from perfected. Here's our first problem. X-rays only detected hard objects like bullets and shrapnel, not items like wood, splinters and bits of dirty cloth that might cause infection. Remember the problem of bullets and shrapnel taking bits of uniforms and mud inside the wounds. However, doctors tried to get around this limitation by carefully searching for such fragments while operating. And at least an X-ray might help uh, narrow down the area that you'd need to search. Another problem was that X-ray images took several minutes to take. This was difficult if a man was writhing in agony. If he was moving around, then the images would be blurred. However, soldiers could be sedated where such medicines were available, perhaps with an anaesthetic. Another problem was that x-ray tubes heated up and needed to be left for about an hour to cool down. During major offences, this made it difficult to keep up with demand. However, increasing numbers of machines meant that three could be used in rotation to allow cooling. 
From 1917, the USA entered the war. They brought improved tubes to France developed by William Coolidge, which didn't heat up quite so much. So there are problems, but they found ways around them. Ingenious. Your tasks then. Summarise the main problems with the X-ray machines in World War I in a paragraph or two. Then, how far was each problem solved? Was it solved entirely or only to an extent? Take each solution in turn and explain to what extent it solved the problem that it's associated with. So, for example, how much did doctors trying to find the fragments in the wounds solve the problem of x-rays not picking up on things like wood and bits of dirty cloth within the wounds? All right, pause the video here and then press play when you're ready to continue. Hopefully you've got a good summary of the main problems with the x-rays now and the solutions. So each problem was solved, but only to an extent. For example, the problem of only finding uh, the bones and the bits of uh, shrapnel, as opposed to finding things like wood and mud and bits of dirty cloth, was only really solved to a limited extent. This invasive searching for such fragments was necessary, but couldn't itself increase the risk of infection and certainly made the operations more severe. However, the writhing around of men who were in agony was really well solved if a sedative could be administered. The fact that painkillers were often a standard part of the procedure for treating men in such agony only helps this, but it is reliant, of course, on supplies of it being available. And what about the cooling problem? Well, this is solved, but only to an extent. You wouldn't always be able to have three machines in operation at the same time. Obviously, this might be down to the fact that you simply didn't have the machines with you, or it might be down to the fact that a major offensive might result in even more casualties than you could really cope with. It's good that the USA was able to bring supplies along with them after 1917, but this is only really late in the war, and of course, they wouldn't have been able to bring them over and share them with all countries. So, we can only really say that the problem of the X-ray tubes themselves heating up is only solved to a small extent. It's time to check your knowledge. This last task also includes some revision, so do try and contain your excitement. Try to answer the following questions from memory, both from this lesson and from previous ones. You should only need a word or two for most of the questions, so don't spend too long on it. Pause the video now and press play when you're ready to see the answers. Done? Let's have a look at the answers then. Which discovery was made by Willem Röntgen? That was x-rays. Which surgeon pioneered the use of antiseptics such as carbolic acid? That was Joseph Lister. In which decade did the pioneer of antiseptics publish his work? In the 1860s. Which major surgical problem was still unsolved by 1900? That was shock. What is the difference between aseptic and antiseptic surgery? Well, aseptic surgery means that the germs aren't present. When did Röntgen make his discovery? 1895. And what was Karl Landsteiner's important discovery? Blood groups. And which breakthrough by a French scientist inspired antiseptic surgery? That was germ theory, and that was by Louis Pasteur. OK, make any corrections that you need to, and then we'll continue. Finally then, which of the following developments had the greatest use in peace? You may have heard the song, War, What Is It Good For? absolutely nothing. Well, actually, in some respects, that's probably not quite fair. War might be a terrible thing, but the problems that war presents often bring solutions that benefit people in peacetime as well, and medicine's no different in that respect. Let's consider the impact of x-rays in peacetime, blood transfusions, aseptic surgery. First of all, select the most useful development and say why you chose it. When I say useful, I mean useful in peacetime, not in treating World War I soldiers. Explain how your choice would be useful in times of both peace and uh, as well as war. So maybe describe a situation it could be used in peacetime and a situation it could be used in wartime. And then lastly, give a specific example of how your chosen development is used, perhaps even how it is used today. Pause the video while you make your final completions on those answers. Done? Well, I wonder what you chose for the most useful development. Perhaps you can pop it in the comments below with a justification of your choice. You may have chosen x-rays. After all, they're still used today to diagnose broken bones and to find foreign objects within the body. You may have chosen blood transfusions. There are so many ways that blood transfusions are life-saving today. 
in everything from mothers who are giving birth to people on the operating table to those in accidents. And then there's aseptic surgery. Would surgery really be possible if we didn't have aseptic surgery and we were still relying on things like Lister's carbolic spray? So how would your choice be useful in peace as well as war? Well, with x-rays, it's not just about finding bullets and shrapnel. Today, it can be used for diagnosing any sort of uh, ailment like that, and indeed things like broken bones. Quite a few of you watching this, and indeed um, this counts for me as well, as well, would have had an x-ray at some point in their life. Blood transfusions are also really life-saving. Blood transfusions can be used in, in wartime to prevent shock from soldiers bleeding out because of wounds. But in peacetime, they can be used in everything from, like I say, operating tables to in midwifery. Blood loss is often something uh, that can be a complication from, uh, mother, for mothers in childbirth, and blood transfusions are hugely life-saving. So a specific example of how your chosen development is used? Well, I've mentioned some in the last couple of minutes, so hopefully that will give you the ideas that you need. And at that note, that's the end of the lesson. And I hope that you've now got a bit of a better appreciation of how developments from uh, peacetime were actually helped in wartime, but also accelerations in the developments during wartime helped the peacetime use of these developments too. That might be a bit of a mouthful to say. But war, what is it good for? Not a lot, but it is good for advancing certain scientific techniques. And medicine is no different in that respect. If this was useful to you, hopefully you found it interesting as well, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. Thanks very much and good health.